Good evening, friends, and welcome to the Pinnacle of Prophecy, Unlocking Revelations Mysteries. We want to welcome those who are here, Granite Bay, California. We also want to welcome those who are joining us across the country and around the world. We're having a great time studying these important prophecies in the very heart of the book of Revelation. Now, if you've missed any of the previous presentations or would like to get all of the lessons, I've been told that they are now available at the Amazing Facts store. You just go to the Amazing Facts website, amazingfacts.com or .org, and you click on the store link, and you'll be able to get all of the lessons. Or if you like, you see a QR code on your screen, you can just take a picture of that QR code, and that'll take you to the Amazing Facts store where you'll be able to download all of the lessons. And of course, for those of you who are here in person, you get the lessons as you leave each night. Well, in addition to the lessons that we are going through in each presentation, we also have a free offer that will help you understand or even help grow your understanding of the topic that we're studying about. And tonight, we have one of our amazing fact sharing magazines. It's called A Divine Design. And this is free. So if you'd like to receive a digital copy of this, you can do it several ways. You can take a picture of the QR code that you see on your screen, or you can text the word uh, divine 7 to the number 40544, or if you're outside of North America, just go to the website, pinnacleofprophecy.com, and you'll be able to download the magazine. This is beautifully illustrated, talking about the sanctuary, so you want to take advantage of that. Well, of course, we have a theme song that we have been singing from night to night, Jesus Shine On Me, and we're going to invite you to stand, and we're going to sing together, sing nice and loud, Jesus Shine On Me. And friends, those of you at home, Join in and sing with us as well. Jesus, shine on me. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you once again that we have this time to open up your word and study a very important truth found in scripture, in Revelation, and throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Father, we are so grateful that we have a high priest in heaven, Jesus, who is ministering before us, for us, before the Father. And Lord, we just pray that you would guide our minds and our hearts as we study this important truth tonight. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Again, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And of course, we like the Q&A section, questions and answers. And thank you for all of the questions that those of you are watching have sent in. If you have a question, you can just take a picture of the QR code, type in the question there. And of course, you can do it, of course, here as well. And we're going to try to answer as many questions as we can. So at this time, we're going to invite Pastor Doug and Karen, and they're going to be leading out in our Bible questions. Thank you, Pastor Ross, and good evening, everybody. Thank you for coming, and welcome once again to the Pinnacle of Prophecy meetings. I know that every night there are some people maybe joining us for the first time, and we're glad that you are tuning in. This is a brand new special Bible study prophecy emphasis series that is based on Revelation chapter 14, which is something of a pinnacle in the book of Revelation that you can use as a springboard to teach all of the major prophecy subjects. And we're doing this chapter 14 in 14 lessons, and tonight we're on lesson number six. But before we get to it, we love to take uh, questions. So I'm glad Mrs. Bachelor, I like calling her Mrs. Bachelor, it's an oxymoron, is uh, joining me for the questions. O on my mark, okay. On the other side of the, Here? the box. It, it goes on the other side of the Welcome box. Welcome to my world. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. All right, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Where does the Bible say the patriarchs and their households kept the Sabbath? Yeah, it's normal after we do the Sabbath presentation, which was our last program, 
that we're going to get a few questions on that because it's, it's just sort of a rocks the world of many Christians when they see all of the evidence. So I shared with you that they were keeping the Sabbath uh, long before the Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. It goes back to where do you find their Sabbath first mentioned? What chapter in the Bible? Genesis. Genesis. What's the first book in the Bible? Genesis. They're on the seventh day. God blessed the seventh day and the hallowed the Sabbath day. Who did he bless and hallow it for? For himself? Or is this all in the context of making man in his own image? And then Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man and it was blessed for man. So right there in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve are keeping it. But then you can go to, this isn't specific, but if you go to Genesis chapter 26, speaking of Abraham, God says, Abraham kept my laws, my statutes, my judgments. And don't forget that little word, keep. What does it say in the Sabbath commandment? Remember the Sabbath day to keep, keep it holy. Follow me. You come to my house to visit up in the hills. We heat the house with firewood. And while you're visiting, I say, hey, do you mind keeping the fire going? Karen and I have to run to town. And you say, yeah, no problem. So we leave, and you go over to see how the fire's doing just to make sure you're doing your job well, and you open the stove, and there ain't no fire. It's just cold stone, <laughs> dead, nothing going on, not even warm. And you think, why would Doug tell me to keep the fire going if there was no fire already? So implied in that commandment, keep the Sabbath day holy. God says, I made it holy. Mm -hmm. I want you to remember to keep it holy. It's pretty clear even right in the commandment. It existed before then. But wait, there's more. <laughs> if long before you even get to the Ten Commandments, you just look at, um, oh, it's in Exodus chapter 5. When Moses first comes to the Pharaoh and he says, let my people go, before he went to the Pharaoh, Moses met with the elders and told them to consecrate themselves to the Lord. And then the Pharaoh says, this is Exodus 5, verse 5. Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you are making them rest. In Hebrew, that says, you are making them Shabbat. And it's the Sabbath, same word. And then you go to Exodus 16. Ten Commandments don't come until Exodus 20. Mm -hmm. In Exodus 16, God said, uh, the people went out, and he said, don't gather uh, the manna on the seventh day. There will be none. Gather twice as much on the sixth day. See, if they gathered too much on the first, second, third, fourth, fifth day, it would breed worms. He said, don't store it. I'll give it to you fresh every day because it's the Bible. We need it fresh every day. Mm -hmm. Give us this day our daily bread. We shouldn't just read the Bible once a week. So I'll give it to you fresh every day. Friday, you can get twice as much. I don't want you to go out and gather on Sabbath. That's Exodus 16. The people went out looking for manna. They disobeyed, and God said, how long will you refuse to keep my commandments? He's calling it a commandment before they ever get to the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. So that's the best I can do, but I think that's pretty good evidence. Amen. All right, Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, Satan, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but they did not prevail. Was this a physical fight with real weapons? Yes, I think there were some kind of real weapons. Uh, how physical, you know? The Bible says when it comes to fighting the devil, Ephesians chapter 6, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It, sometimes you probably wish we could just punch the devil in the nose, but you can't do it that way. We're wrestling with spiritual forces, principalities, and powers in heavenly places. Mm -hmm. Now, you do see when God sent an angel, after Adam and Eve sinned, they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, God sent an angel with a flaming sword to guard the way to the tree of life. And then you look in Ezekiel chapter 9, and it talks about these angels with battle weapons. It's not real clear what they were, uh, but... And then you've got the angel of the Lord with a sword over Jerusalem. When David numbered Israel and God cursed the nation for their pride, so David looked up and he saw an angel with a drawn sword. Uh, you saw Balaam saw an angel with a drawn sword. It might just be it's a drawn sword so we can relate to it. I don't know. Amazing Facts did a video. It's got millions of views called Cosmic Conflict. And we needed to recreate angels fighting. <laughs> we didn't know what to do. But... Um, the producer ended up getting these uh, laser sticks, and it looks a little like Star Wars. I just got to tell <laughs> <Lightsabers>. you. Lightsabers. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. But uh, 
you know, it, it was kind of hard for us to recreate that. I think we'd do it a little better if we could do it again, but we don't know what the weapons were. Well, th some of these questions will be fun to see when we get to heaven and ask them. Yes, I just hope we don't see any more wars up no. there. Amen? <laughs> will the redeemed of the earth replace the positions of the one-third of the angels who rebelled? Well, yes and no. The, the redeemed will repopulate the earth, and there were, of course, one-third of the angels that will be cast into the lake of fire with Satan. You see that in Matthew 25 and also in Revelation 22, 20, 20. And, um, but humans aren't replacing angels. The work of the angels will not be exactly duplicated by the humans that are redeemed. But yes, there will be new creatures. And I don't think God's done creating. I think He is a creator. He's creative. And through the eternal ages, He's got infinite space. God's going to continue to create. And so whether He'll make more angels or how He does that, not sure. Why does Jesus say, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in His kingdom? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. Jesus actually says that. You'll find it three times, both in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I'll read this to you real quick. And this is from Mark chapter 9, verse 1. And Jesus makes a statement. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some of you standing here who will not taste of death, till you see the king kingdom of God come with power. Then immediately after he makes the statement is the fulfillment of why he said it. It says, after six days he took them up. And by the way, you remember we talked about the 6,000 years of world history? Peter says a day with the Lord is like a 1,000 years and a 1,000 years like a day. I think it's interesting that Jesus waited six days and then he took them up the mountain. After six days we go, oh, I hope. Anyway, so after six days, he took Peter, James, and John. He led up, up to a mountain. He's praying. His clothes became shining exceedingly white, as they will be when he comes, like snow. Elijah appears. Elijah is translated without dying. And Moses appears. Moses died but was resurrected. There's two kinds of people that are saved when Jesus comes, the resurrected and the translated. And then the voice of God says, this is my beloved son. And so here Jesus is surrounded with clouds of glory as he will be. He's got the resurrected. He's got the translated. He's coming in the glory of the Father. It is a miniature picture of the second coming. And so he told the disciples, some of you here are not going to die until you see the kingdom of God. In other words, you will see me glorified as I will be when I come. You will see a miniature picture of the second coming. Jesus was not saying that he would come before they died. The end of the Gospel of John, Jesus, or John makes it very clear Christ was not saying that because all the apostles died before the second coming. So he was saying, you're going to see a miniature picture so you'll know what it's like. All right, thank you. All right, here's another question. Are the Jews in Israel today the same Jews of the Bible? Well, y yes and no. Now, you might be wondering, are they, you know, the exact same bloodline, if you check the DNA, would it be identical with the DNA that you find in Jewish graves in Jerusalem today? Probably not exactly, but you definitely see that that was the people. Um, I actually saw this question, and I went online to find out what kind of research they've been doing, and in September, they found some graves. They're quite certain are, it's a Jewish family, and they found good DNA, and they're doing testing right now. But I can sort of tell you already that as time goes by, people intermarry. Jews have been all over the world, and my mother was Jewish. I think I told you. One of our family, maybe it was you, got, did a DNA test? Yes. You want to find out if I really was your husband? No, I haven't done it yet. Okay. <laughs> That's a joke. But uh, <laughs> anyway, so we did it, and it says that we're Ashkenazi Jews in our family, my mother's side, and everything else, but not even pure. I thought I'd be 50% because my mother was. But you know, when the Jewish people have lived in Italy and Spain and Russia and Germany and all these different parts of the world, every now and then someone marries outside of the family and then they remarry and you end up with, you know, a little hodgepodge. And so I'm sure there's DNA from many different groups. The thing is, the Jewish people have maintained a distinct identity, mm -hmm. language, culture, and it's all because they have the Bible, their scriptures that has kept them together and given that, that unity. You know, there are certain diseases that only Jews get. Yeah. And, and so, you know, I believe they are a distinct people. 
Will the plagues at the end of time be regional or all over the world? I'm inclined to think, now when we say plagues, the seven last plagues, Revelation 15, 16, you've got the water turns to blood, the fresh water turns to blood, the seas turn to blood, not in that order. Uh, men are afflicted with a noisome and a grievous sore. They are scorched with great heat. heat. There's darkness on the seat of the beast. And the final plague is Jesus coming. There's a great earthquake. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't think they're universal because how long would the world last if you had all those things happening simultaneously everywhere? And when men are scorched with great heat, it probably won't be as bad in Alaska as it would be on the equator. So, yeah, you know, just what we've seen, how God works with plagues through history, even when the plagues fell on Egypt, you notice that the Israelites in the land of Goshen were protected, and they weren't very far away. So there's be places I think it's going to be more intense, probably the places where the persecution has been the worst, the plagues will be the worst. Uh, the other thing is people say, how long will it be? How long will those seven last plagues be? Some have said, is it seven years of plagues? No, I seriously doubt it. If you look in the Bible, the plagues that fell on Job, how long did that take? Came in quick succession. Mm -hmm. The ten plagues that, I'll tell you a little, uh, something you might find interesting. Ten plagues fell on the Egyptians, only seven plagues in Revelation. Why the difference? Many of the plagues are the same. What's the difference? The difference is that the Jews were not protected from the first three plagues that fell on Egypt. They were protected through the last seven plagues that fell on the Egyptians. The seven plagues in Revelation tell us we are protected during that time. So um, the plagues in Moses' day, they're coming back to back. They'd all probably happened in just a matter of a couple of months. And then the Pharaoh said, get out of here. So I don't think it's going to take a long time. Revelation says all of her plagues will come in a day. And that means within a year's time, it all happens. Uh, so short period of time, but pretty serious. Yes. Can 10% tithing be accomplished by giving to a church, or can it be accomplished by giving to others? Well, we've invited all kinds of Bible questions. And this, you know, the questions when they come in on the device, Karen's got, they're actually rated. This question kept coming in. It's, it's the number so we, one rated question. Yeah. So um, if you're married to a particular woman, but you're sending your resources to a different woman, how will that go? She won't like it at all. So if you're attending a church, shouldn't that be the place? If you're soaking up the benefits and the blessings and the resources of a church, you should be supporting that church family. Mm -hmm. So I think the answer is a, a rather a simple one. You can also read there in Malachi chapter 3, it says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. The tithes were sent to a central storehouse, so it was evenly distributed to the Levites, and the work in the various synagogues and temple was supported. So I think you should support the church you're attending and where the truth is being proclaimed and you're getting the blessings. All right, our time is running short. So for our last question, okay. will we have wings when we go to heaven and will we be able to fly? Well, you know, um, will we be able to fly? I believe so. How many of you have sung that song, Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me? No one knows that song? Oh, whew. you all kind of sat there like, I thought I was preaching to a virtual church. <laughs> You know, there's a verse in there that says, when I soar to worlds unknown. Now, that's not the Bible, but we've all sung it, haven't we? The Bible does say in Isaiah, we will mount up with wings like eagles. And so I, I don't think we're going to be quarantined on this family, on this planet, but we're going to be able to see other worlds that God has made. Will they be wings like, you know, a, a stork or an eagle or something? I, you know, I don't know exactly what angels' wings are like. Angel seems to be able to make their wings disappear, but angels do have wings. Um, but several times when they appear, they appear as men, and they don't know that they've got wings. But somehow they're able to speed, uh, travel through space, the speed of thought. So yes, we'll be able to travel through the cosmos without a spacesuit, and uh, God gives us some kind of wings to travel. All right, thank, thank you, you very much for your questions. Yeah, and if you have uh, questions, for those who joined us, you can go to the QR code that you see on the screen 
and I think you know how to do that. You aim your camera there. It should automatically pop up the website and then go there and send in your questions. We invite questions, especially on the subjects we've covered, but we welcome any Bible question or anything about living the Christian life. All right, well, Pastor Ross and I are going to do a little pinnacle perspective review on some of what we've talked about and some of what's coming. Okay, very good. Well, Pastor Doug, last night you did a very important subject. You spoke about, well, the, the fourth commandment that says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Whenever one talks about the Sabbath truth, I've got to fix my mic here because it's busy crackling. Hold on a second. If you'd shave, it'd be better. Yeah, maybe. Okay. <laughs> All right, there we go. I think that's better. So when you talk about the Sabbath, usually folks will say, well, well, what about this verse? What about that verse? There are really four verses, one of four verses that's usually referred to kind of support the idea that the Sabbath is no longer significant or binding on Christians, or that there was some kind of a transfer from the seventh day of the week to the first of the week. So we want to take a few moments and look at some of these verses, and I've got them here. The first one is Acts 20, mm -hmm. Acts 20, verse 7. I'm going to read it, and then you can talk about it. It says, now on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them, and continued his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where they had gathered together. So some say, aha, first day of the week, they came together for communion and for church. Is that what it's talking about? Now, if you read the whole story, the reason Luke is including Acts, you read on, and it says, and Paul preached until midnight, and there was a certain young man named Eutychus that sat in a window, and there were many lights. When it says many lights in the Bible, it means that there's a lot of smoke. Their lights were not electric. And so he sat in the window so he could get some fresh air. But then it says, but Paul was long in preaching. There's a danger in preaching too long. And Eutychus fell asleep. See, things haven't changed, have they? <laughs> and he fell out of the third story window and was taken up dead. And Paul went down and embraced him and said, do not fear, his life is yet in him. And he revived. And the people were much comforted. The whole story is there, not because God had changed one of the commandments or established a new one. It's saying when they gathered on Sabbath, the seventh day, when do we discover days end and begin in the Bible? Sundown. So they were together for that Sabbath. Paul's leaving the next day, which would be Sunday. Would a Jew travel on a long journey on Sunday, on the Sabbath? No. So they, he didn't see the Sabbath. He's doing a farewell, so he preaches long when they actually are gathered together and they break bread that morning, it just means they ate together. It says that they got up and they broke bread. And even if they did do a communion service, that wouldn't make it a new Sabbath day. You know, you can do a communion service any day of the week. What day of the week was the first communion? Thursday. So the idea that they had gotten together, it, they were together Sabbath. Paul preaches into the first day of the week. Eutychus falls out the window. There's a resurrection. That's why the story is there. It's not making a statement about, notice this, friends, God has changed one of the Ten Commandments. Wouldn't there be something more obvious if God was going to change one of the Ten Commandments, only one of them? I think so. Okay, very good. Here's another Bible verse that's sometimes referred to, Romans chapter 14 and verse 5. And here I'm going to read it. Paul, of course, is writing, and he says, One person esteems one day above another, Another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. So some say, well, doesn't this seem to indicate that it's not that big of a deal whether or not one keeps the Sabbath? If you want to, go right ahead. If you don't, well, that's fine too. Is that what Paul is saying? No one ever quotes this verse until they learn the Sabbath truth. I've never heard a pastor of a Sunday church tell his congregation, if you want to come Sunday, great. If you don't, that's however you feel. They never do that. They want them there. They want them to treat it special. But when they learn the Sabbath, they say, no, you know, it's, it's whatever you feel like. This had nothing to do with Saturday or Sunday. Jewish Christians who had accepted Jesus were telling the Gentile, Greek converts to Christianity, you need to keep the ceremonial Sabbaths and feast days. Because he also talks in the same passage about he that eats and he that doesn't eat, meaning fasting, feast days and fast days, and uh, eating things sacrificed to idols. It had nothing to do, the word Sabbath doesn't appear anywhere in the passage. It's not in the whole chapter. It's talking about you do not have to keep these ceremonial Sabbaths, these annual Sabbaths. 
If you want to remember the Passover, great. Paul went down to celebrate the Passover so that he could preach to Jews, but he said, Jesus is our Passover now. He was just doing that to reach them. That's what they're talking about. It's not talking about the uh, fourth commandment. Okay, we've got two more verses that are sometimes quoted when the Sabbath subject comes up. And here's the next one. 1 Corinthians 16 and um, verse 1. 1 and 2. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 1, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, I have given orders to the churches in Galatia, so you must also do. On the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he may prosper, that there be no collections when I come. So, ha ha, here it is. There is a Sunday service, and they're taking up a special offering, and they're going to give it to Paul when he's on his way to uh, Jerusalem. Is that what it's talking about? All right, let's read it honestly now. First of all, if you have uh, your Bible in front of you when it says the first day, you'll notice the word day is in italics. That means it's not even in the original language. It says on the first of the week. The first of the week means the beginning of the week. It says, set aside by you at home. It's not something happening in a church. They were to, when they got, the Jews typically, they gave their offerings on Sabbath, and on the first day of the week, they'd get their accounts in order for the coming week. And Paul's saying, when you're getting your accounts in order for the coming week, set something extra aside so that there is no offering when I come, but I'm going to come through town, hand it off, and I'm taking off. I'm in a hurry to take relief to the churches in Jerusalem for a famine. That's what this was about. He said, just set it aside. doesn't say when you take an offering in church. doesn't say there's a church meeting at all. It just says in the beginning of the week, set something aside that there is no offering when I come, as I've given order to the churches of Galatia. Again, you have to ask the question, is there a commandment somewhere to now keep the first day holy? If all of a sudden, how many of you have been to England? i to watch the clock here, make sure I don't... Is it weird when you go to Australia, Hong Kong, England, and they're driving on the wrong side of the road? They think we're weird when they come over here. And every time you cross the street, you need to be really careful that you look the right way because they've had some serious accidents because we all drive on the other side of the road. If I was to tell you, folks, you may have missed it, but tomorrow in America, just for universal cooperation, we're all going to start driving like England. How many of you would believe me? You wouldn't believe me. Would America change a law like that that is so entrenched in our culture without a long period of careful announcement and advertising? You see what I'm saying? If one of the Ten Commandments that had been kept for thousands of years that was entrenched in the Jewish Scriptures and the culture was to be changed to a different day, wouldn't someone in the New Testament have said, by the way, we're now supposed to keep the first day as the new Sabbath. The commandment has been changed or done away with. So is that reasonable? It's not there. So I think it's safe to assume that it hasn't changed. What was wrong with the seventh day? Why would God change it? Did the seventh day do something bad? No, Jesus rose on Sunday. That's wonderful. Not to rest. He rested in the tomb on, his sa on the Sabbath. He rose to continue his work as our high priest. All right, last verse, Pastor Doug. Here it is, Colossians chapter 2. So let no one judge you in food, in drink, in regards to a festival, a new moon, or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of things to come, but the substance is of Christ. There we go. You can't judge anyone on what day they choose to be the Sabbath. Now, if you have these verses open before you, you'll notice it says, let no one judge you regarding Sabbath days, plural, did the Jews have other Sabbath days that were not part of the Ten Commandments? Once again, there was a big dispute. The Jewish Christians were trying to impose the ceremonial laws and the Gentiles. Paul said, don't let anyone judge you regarding the Sabbath days. Notice the wordings, which are shadows of things to come. The ceremonial laws are types and shadows. Did the Sabbath of the Fourth Commandment, did it come before or after sin? Before sin, it was part of God's perfect plan, and it's eternal. All right, very good. Well, you did a good job in answering those key questions. Stand by for our lesson for tonight.
Welcome back, friends, to the Pinnacle of Prophecy. And we're excited about our study tonight. It's the Temple of God. Now, for those of you who are here in person, you can open up your lesson and get ready to fill in the answers. If you're watching online or on the various networks, you can go to the Pinnacle of Prophecy website, just pinnacleofprophecy.com. You can download lesson number six, which is the Temple of God, and you can study along with us. But before we get to the lesson, Jackie is going to be bringing a beautiful number, and she's going to want your participation. She's going to be doing the song, Sanctuary. Thank you, Pastor Ross. I want to invite everyone to sing along with me. Again, this song is called Sanctuary, and the words are on your screen. Jackie, that's perfect for our presentation tonight. Can you say amen? amen? Because we're going to be talking about the sanctuary. Welcome again, friends, to the Pinnacle of Prophecy series. This is a new Bible study spectacular dealing with the book of Revelation, that Pinnacle chapter 14, three angel messages that go to the world before the coming of the Lord, and prophecy is being fulfilled in your hearing right now. As we are broadcasting this around the world, I want to welcome our friends that are watching on 3ABN and AFTV and Good News Broadcasting, YouTube, Facebook, and a lot of other social media sites. Our study tonight is dealing with the subject of the sanctuary. It's called the Temple of God. Now, I want to tell you that we are going to be doing really uh, a two-part study. This is Tonight is part one. And tomorrow night, of course, is lesson number seven. It's the hour of judgment. These tie together in Bible prophecies in both Revelation and Daniel. And so um, I hope that you can make it because I think you're going to be blessed and edified. And it's even relating to things that are in the headlines today. So I hope you come. Pray for me as I teach and preach because I've got so much to share I have the slides. I don't have many notes. And so I just pray the Holy Spirit will help me remember to emphasize the most important points as I share with you. The temple of God is our study for tonight. But uh, I like to start with an amazing fact. And I think you'll find this one in your lesson. How many of you at some point have either owned or your children have owned what they call a matchbox car? Let me see your hands. That's right. That, 
The first Matchbox was actually a little toy tractor, and it was so popular that they began to make more and more of them there in England, and it just spread out, and they took off. And um, I remember every time I'd take my kids to Kmart or Walmart, if they were good, I'd spend 99 cents. They weren't much back then. I'd get them a new one for the collection. I think to this day in our attic, we have a bucket. Anyone else? Got a bucket of little Hot Wheels Matchbox cars. That's the difference between Hot Wheels and Matchbox, but they're similar. Something that a lot of people don't know is Matchbox was very meticulous when they would make a new model. And did you know they have 12,000 different models that they've made of cars? That they would take a full-size car and they would precisely measure it. They used to do it the hard way years ago. Now they use lasers. And the Matchbox car is exactly 1 64th of the original size of the vehicle. It's a super-duper miniature scale model. Do you know that since uh, Matchbox cars came out, they have made three billion cars? And we've got about one million. <laughs> no, we don't have that many. Well, the reason I mention this and we threw this fact in is because the Bible tells us about a sanctuary. There's actually three of them. Now, when I say sanctuary, you, you've got different words. One is the word tabernacle. That's typically assigned to the sanctuary they had in the wilderness. Then you've got the word sanctuary, and then you've got the word temple. It's good for you to be here tonight to understand these things, because not only does it affect our society every day when we talk about sanctuary cities, our countries that are sanctuary, a person that is given sanctuary, but in the Middle East right now, there is a major conflict at the time of this recording. And if you boil it down, a lot of it has to do with some sacred real estate on top of a mountain called Mount Moriah. It's sacred real estate for three major, you could argue four major religions of the world. There are about 2.2 billion Christians in the world. That's including Protestants and Catholics, Orthodox Christians. There's about 1.7 Muslims in the world, and there's about 16 million Jews. And that mountaintop is a holy spot. Now, to give you a little quick overview of why this is such an interesting piece of real estate, it goes all the way back to the time of Abraham. It's first mentioned when Abraham wins a battle against these kings of the north. His name was Chedorlaomer up by Damascus. Still in the news today, right? Battle between Abraham and the people of Syria in the north. And he rescued Lot that had been captured from Sodom. And Abraham got all this bounty from the war, and on his way back, he stopped in a small town called Salem, where there was a king priest named Melchizedek. It's the first time Salem is mentioned. The word Jerusalem, Jerusalem, it means city of peace. But this is the place. Later, God says to Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, who you love, and I want you to bring him to the mountains of Moriah and offer him there for me. Abraham went from Hebron or wherever he was at the time and, and he went to the mountains of Moriah, Mount Zion, same place, the vicinity of Salem, and he went up the mountain to offer Isaac. And it's, it's a story really of the plan of salvation. The father and son go up the mountain. Abraham places the wood on Isaac's back. The cross was placed on Jesus' back. And on the way up the hill, Isaac's gone to sacrifice before with his father. He says, uh, Father, I see that we've got the sacrifice, or rather we've got the wood, and we've got the fire, what it would take the tinder and flint to make the fire. He said, but where is the sacrifice? Where's the lamb? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. They got to the top. Abraham told his son what God had asked him to do. Isaac willingly offered himself as a sacrifice. Just before the knife came down, God stopped him and said, Abraham, Abraham, do not harm the lad. Now I know that you trust me. This was an, an allegory of what the father and son would do for you and me. God so loved the world, he gave his son. Abraham's the father of the faithful. He was willing to sacrifice his son and obey God. Years later, David, who is a descendant from Abraham, an angel of judgments going through the land of Israel, and thousands were dying from a plague because of their pride, and David had instigated their pride. And David looked up and he saw an angel with a drawn sword 
over Mount Moriah, the very place where Abraham offered Isaac. It was owned by a Jebusite named Oran back then, or Ornan. And um, David prayed and said, let this punishment be on me, but what have these sheep done? Again, you see there's a judgment in their sheep. And God stops and David goes and he offers sacrifice. He buys the threshing floor and offers sacrifice and the judgment is stopped. The angel of judgment is stayed. That again is on Mount Zion. Later, David tells Solomon, this is the place that God has chosen to build his house. And so that became the place where once they got into the promised land with a portable temple, they ended up building the permanent temple. When it was destroyed by the Babylonians and the captives came back from Babylon seven years later, Ezra and Nehemiah, they built another one. That began to dilapidate and during the time of Jesus, Herod the Great refurbished it. But they were always built on that same real estate. Now the problem is after the Jews were conquered by the Romans and the temple was destroyed again by the Romans in 70 A.D., that the, uh, the Muslims, knowing that was the holy site, they built the mosque right on the spot because there had been long-standing animosity between those two peoples, as there still is today. So that's a quick overview, but uh, why is this coming from our Revelation study? Our verse from Revelation 14, it says... You look better now. Oh, thank you. Did I? Was that bothering you? I didn't see anything about it. I got a good wife taking care of me. So why are we doing this from Revelation 14? If you look in verse 17, it specifically mentions the temple. Then another angel came out of the temple that was in heaven, also having a sharp sickle. This is part of the harvest of the earth that's going to happen. So with that background, let's get into our lesson. You have your lessons. We're going to be calling out answers. You at home. Don't forget, you can download your lessons by going to pinnacleofprophecy.com and you can fill in the spaces there. I hope you'll look them up later and read the contents. It'll help you understand this and study truth with others. What did God ask Moses to build and why? You read in Exodus 25, verse 8, And let them make me a sanctuary that I might dwell among them. Now, Jesus is with us everywhere we go, but God wanted them to have a place that was a physical presence that they could see because we kind of live in time and space. This was so important to the Lord that when the plagues fell on Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, instead of going north up to the Promised Land, God said, no, I want you to go south down to Mount Sinai. And they went to Mount Sinai and there not only did they get the Ten Commandments, but Moses stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. It doesn't take 40 days and 40 nights to write the 300 words of the Ten Commandments. While he was there on the mountain, God gave him instructions about building an edifice. He says, let them make me a sanctuary. From where did these sanctuary blueprints originate? Where did Moses get the plans? Did he just dream it up? The Bible tells us, Exodus 25:40. And see to it that you make them according to the what? The pattern, the design, which was shown you in the mountain. Now this sanctuary, this earthly sanctuary, is like a miniature of a very real sanctuary that God has in heaven where He dwells. Just like the, uh, well not quite like the matchbox cars or a reduction of the original, but um, I can promise you that like on the sanctuary on earth, they had uh, a room with golden angels carved in the walls. In heaven, God's got a living wall of angels. Sanctuary on earth, they had angels on the right and left of the Ark of the Covenant. In heaven, they're real angels. In fact, friends, the, sa the subject of the sanctuary is all through the book of Revelation. We need to understand it. A lot of the Bible you will not understand. The subject of the sanctuary in the temple goes from Exodus to Revelation. That's a lot of Bible. Yet a lot of Christians never study this subject and it is filled with meaning that helps us understand the plan of salvation. Revelation chapter 1, where does Jesus first appear? Standing among seven candlesticks. That was in the sanctuary. You read later, it talks about the angel took coals from the altar of incense. That was in the sanctuary. It said, I saw the temple of God open in heaven. I saw the ark that was in the sanctuary. 
And so underneath the altar were the souls of those who had been beheaded for Jesus. The altar, that was in the sanctuary. So the context of this vision is in the sanctuary. And if you look in like Isaiah chapter 6 and you read the first few verses there. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and the train of his robe filled the temple and on the right and the left were seraphim and they cried one to another and they each had six wings. With two wings they covered their face, with two wings they covered their feet, with two they did fly and they cried one to the other and they said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Here you have a picture of God on his throne between two living seraphim and the little ark that Moses made on earth with those angels on top, that was a symbol of the dwelling place of God. And when God would meet with Moses, he would meet with him in the holy of holies between the Shekinah glory, they called it, the glory of God between those two angels. And so this teaching, if you read the last eight chapters in the book of Ezekiel, you know what it's talking about? The temple. So it's all through the Bible. And we need to understand this. Why? Well, the plans were given to Noah to build an ark. You realize Noah didn't just decide, having never seen rain, one day he's going to build a boat. Where did the design for the boat come from? Genesis 6.15, this is how you shall make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits. It's width 50 cubits. It's height 30 cubits. Did that come from Noah or from God? Did you know that Jesus was a carpenter? God is a builder, and He designs things. And He not only designed the ark, and you know what? It worked, didn't it? I heard someone say the dimensions and the ratios in the ark are the same ratios that they use now for the most enduring seagoing vessels because it's just it's the best pattern. Um, so God gives this design to the sanctuary in all three Jewish temples, the one in the wilderness, Solomon's temple, Ezra and Nehemiah's temple, all followed the same pattern. We're going to study that. You notice it says in Hebrews 8, verse 4 and 5, this is uh, part of your lesson also, there are priests who serve the what? The copy and shadow of the heavenly things. As Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle, for he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you in the mountain. They were to make it according to a specific pattern that had been given. Pattern given by who? By God. And you can also read here where it says in Revelation 14, 17, the verse recovered. And then another angel came out of the what? The temple which is in? Does God have a temple in heaven? Why did Jesus say, Think not that I've come to destroy the law and the prophets. I've not come to destroy but fulfill. For I say unto you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one jot or one tittle will in any wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled. By the way, when he said fulfilled there, it doesn't mean done away with. It means filled full. Why does heaven have to pass away? Because the original ark is in heaven with God's law. The Bible tells us there is a temple in heaven and the law is a reflection of God's character we studied the other night. All right, question number three. What did God teach through the sanctuary? What was the object of this? Notice this, Psalm 77, verse 13. Short verse, but very important. Your way, King James says it, thy way, I like that better. Thy way, O God, is in the... Thy way, O God, is in the sanctuary. The way of God. That means the way that He saves us. He expresses himself. Now, the earthly sanctuary was built around a sacrificial system. And I know when I first started reading the Bible, learning these things, I thought, I don't understand all the blood and, and the purpose for the sacrifices. And then as I continued studying, Revelation talks about the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. And then I read where Adam and Eve, when they sinned and their garments of glory went out, they saw their nakedness, they tried to cover it with fig leaves, symbol of self-righteousness. Remember, Jesus cursed a fig tree. And God said, that won't do it, and God gave them skins. Now, where did the skins come from? God established a sacrificial system. 
The penalty for sin was death, not for Adam, but the whole creation suffered. Adam was like the ruler of the world, and when death went to Adam and it went to Eve and their children, it went to the whole planet, became corrupted because of sin. All the creatures suffered. So God said, to cover your nakedness, someday my son is going to come to take away your sins, and uh, his robe of righteousness will cover your sin. But he began the sacrificial system. He showed him how. That's why Abel knew that he was supposed to take a lamb from the flock and offer it. What's the first thing that um, Noah did when he got off out of the ark after the flood? He offered sacrifice. By the way, the animals that were brought on the ark, the unclean animals came by twos. The clean animals came by sevens because they could be used for sacrifice. You should never be offering an unclean animal as a sacrifice uh, to the Lord. And so first thing Abraham, uh, Noah does after the flood, he offers sacrifice. So when the children of Israel all understood the sacrificial system, everywhere Abraham went, he offered sacrifice. And when people made covenants, they offered sacrifice. If you were a Jew and you wanted forgiveness, the way that you found atonement was through a sacrifice. Now, if you lived during the time of the temple, you know, and not every time somebody made a, a simple mistake, if the father got upset because the kids were getting too loud and he slammed his fist on the table, he did not have to run to the sanctuary and kill a lamb. The sanctuary had daily sacrifices for the sins of the people, but then there were things that were more specific and more outrageous where individuals would come to the sanctuary, they'd be looking for redemption and forgiveness, you would place your hands on the head of the lamb and you would confess your sins on the head of the lamb, symbolically transferring your sins from you to the lamb. Then the lamb was taken by the priest, or you might do it yourself if you were the patriarch, and cut its throat. I know it sounds terribly grisly. And they would yeah, catch some of the blood and sprinkle it before the Lord, saying, the life is in the blood. This victim died that the person might live. And what it did is it showed the deadly nature of sin. It showed how costly sin was. And when Jesus came, the lamb that takes away the sin of the world, they understood when we confess our sins, we are placing our sins on God's lamb and he must die for our sins. I remember reading um, years ago in England that some of the young crown princes had what they called a whipping boy. You ever heard the expression, a whipping boy? That's because they believed it was inappropriate for royalty to ever be spanked. And so the closest playmate of the crown prince or princess, whoever there was, if they misbehaved, they said, I'm going to whip your friend. And they hoped that would discourage the crown prince because they would be suffering for them. And, you know, if your best friend gets whipped every time you misbehave, hopefully, unless you're sadistic, you'll be more careful. And so that was the idea. Well, Jesus takes our penalty. That's why when we continue to sin willfully, it says we crucify the Son of God afresh. That ought to break your heart. It grieves the Lord every time we sin. And He rejoices when we, we obey. Amen? So the way of salvation was demonstrated through the sanctuary. Now, we're going to put a little sanctuary up on the screen here. This is an overview. This is sort of an aerial view of the temple. There were three. How many? Three principal places in the sanctuary. You had what they called the courtyard, you had the holy place, then you had the inner sanctum called the holy of holies or the most holy place. There are three phases in salvation. The three phases are, is big theological terms, it's justification, sanctification, glorification. Justification took place in the courtyard where you had the altar and the labor. Sanctification took place in the holy place. Glorification was when you came into the presence of God in the holy of holies. I might also mention at this point that the priests would go and they would offer the sacrifices in the courtyard and the high priest and sometimes others might go into the holy place but only the high priest was to go into the holy of holies and it only happened two times in the Hebrew economy. Once when the temple was built and inaugurated, don't forget that. When they finished building the temple, obviously builders had to be in there when they built it. Moses went in, when they finished it, he sprinkled everything with blood to sanctify it, and then they activated it 
But from then on, the only time a high priest went in was the end of the year on the Day of Atonement. We just passed that period of time, Yom Kippur, about the time this war started. And so only the high priest could go in there because it represented the presence of God. So it's just good for you to have that overview. Now, there are three phases. The children of Israel, their history follows this as well, as you'll see when we proceed. You come out of Egypt. Egypt was you know, on the outside, and they went through the Red Sea. First, they were baptized in a pillar of fire. That was the altar. Then they went through the Red Sea. That was the laver, was filled with water. Then they entered the wilderness. That's where they were sanctified. Then they entered the promised land. That was when they were glorified. Three phases in the Hebrew experience. Justification, sanctification, glorification. Let me explain those real quick because you need to understand. Justification means you come to Jesus just like you are. Like the thief on the cross, you say, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Like Peter sinking and saying, Lord, save me. You're not being saved because you've done anything good. You're crying out for mercy. Say, God, have mercy on me. Like that publican praying in the temple. And God says, because of, if you have faith, I will forgive you and you can come to me and I'll look at you just as if, that's where you get justification, <laughs> just as if you never sinned. He's giving you credit for his perfect life. You haven't done anything except believe. So you're saved by faith through grace. That's justification. Sanctification means now after I have forgiven you, if you love me, follow me in my teaching. That is the learning process. That's when you go into the holy place. And we'll get to that more in a minute. Glorification is ultimately when Jesus comes, we get our glorified bodies and, and we're in the presence of God. So those are the three phases of salvation and that's all demonstrated, the way of God in the sanctuary. Number four, notice, what were the objects in the courtyard? I already touched on them and there'll be some repetition here because I want to have this sink in. First thing you saw when you went in is, who knows? It's the altar of offering. It says, and you will burn the whole ram on the altar. It is a burnt offering to the Lord. First thing that came through the door, and there was a sacrifice. What begins our journey? It's a sacrifice. The first step, when the children of Israel came out of Egypt, what began their journey? They were to eat the Passover sacrifice with their shoes on their feet, their staff in their hand, their unleavened bread on their backs. That's why they eat unleavened bread. And so, first thing was the sacrifice. That was the altar. Do you know that, uh, any of you been to the Big Island of Hawaii? They've got something called the City of Refuge. You ever seen that? It's a, an ancient site. It's a platform. And they had a temple there. And they've got a Hawaiian name that I won't try to repeat for this. But the Hawaiians had a lot of laws. And if you broke one of their laws, it, that was uh, taboo. You are, you know, is it kapu? Kapu. Uh, no, it was tabu, and if you broke tabu, you were kapu, which is like being kaput. And so it was fatal if you broke one of their taboos, and they had a lot of interesting laws. Women were not supposed to eat with men. And the women were not supposed to eat coconuts and certain types of fish, and, and uh, there were certain times of year that no one was supposed to fish for. They had some, just a lot of interesting laws. If you broke one of those taboo laws... You could be killed instantly for that. If you had your shadow go over the high priest or the chief, kapu. And, uh, but if you realize you made a mistake and you immediately hightailed to this platform where the priests live, the city of refuge, you could find atonement and forgiveness. You know, they had something like this in the Bible. It was called cities of refuge. When the children of Israel crossed over, Moses said, I want you to appoint six cities of refuge. Jerusalem ended up being the seventh. But there were six cities that were divided among the children of Israel so that if someone accidentally killed somebody and it was unintentional manslaughter, you're cutting wood, your axe head flies off, bonks your friend in the head and kills him, and the family thinks you did it on purpose, you could go and flee to a city of refuge and they had to keep the roads open and clear to these cities of refuge and then you could lay hold of the horns of the altar and find mercy. And you'll read in the Bible that when Adonijah, he tried to make himself king before Solomon and when he realized that his plot failed, he ran to the temple and he went in and he grabbed hold of the horns of the altar 
And Benaniah, the general, came and he says, what do we do, Solomon? Solomon said he's asked for mercy. If he proves himself to be a worthy man, he will live. And he gave him a time of probation. And so they had this way to, to flee. Now, this is important because you read in the book of Hebrews, it says, now we can flee from the wrath to come. There's a place where we can go and lay hold by faith of that heavenly altar and find forgiveness and mercy in a time of need. So um, then you had also in the courtyard, you had the laver. So this represents the, the, the sacrifice, was the fire, and then you had the water. Now what does Jesus say? Unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven, John chapter 3. Does he say you might not be able to? You cannot. You cannot. You need both baptisms. And I know a lot of churches, they brag about how many people were baptized in water, but they don't care much about baptized in the fire. You remember what uh, John the Baptist said, I baptize you with water, but there's come one coming after I who will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You need both. The children of Israel were baptized in a pillar of fire, and then they went through the Red Sea. It's another kind of baptism. So you have the fire and the water there in the courtyard. Number five, what sanctuary symbol did Jesus fulfill in the altar of sacrifice? The Bible tells us, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7, For indeed, Christ is our Passover, which was sacrificed for us. Now, this is not in the Bible, but I seem to remember reading somewhere in, in, Hewish, in uh, Hebrew tradition that when they brought the lamb in the door of the sanctuary, that they would sacrifice the lamb and catch its blood before they put it, the parts on the altar. And they had a stake. It was a little cross where they would tie it off. How many of you remember when Jesus chased the money changers out of the temple? It says he made a whip of cords. They had these cords that they would use for tying off the lambs. They tie their feet and they tie them around the neck. And they'd hold them close and they'd, they'd cut their throats and they'd catch the blood. So you get a little cross there. It's not in the Bible. I'm just telling you it was a tradition. Then they'd burn the sacrifice on the fire. Christ went through the fire for you and me. Then they would wash when they came to the labor. And we need to go through the fire and the water. It's kind of like the fire and the rain. Elijah prayed, fire came down from heaven. Elijah prayed again, water came down. We need the baptism of the fire, friends, and we need the baptism of the water. Amen? And, of course, who is the lamb? John 1.29 the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of three people. Is that what it says? That takes away the sin of how much? How many of you live in the world? Everybody in the world can take advantage. There is enough sacrifice in Jesus' sufferings to cover all of your sins and the sins of everyone who's ever lived. How can he do that? He's God. We can't figure it out, but he can do it. And the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. I used to think the Bible was sort of a gory book, but I understand that life is kind of gory. The Bible says the life is in the blood. You and I know that every cell in our body is cleansed. <laughs> blood is not just, you know, red when it comes out. It's doing a very important work. If you get a blood disease, you can die. Every cell in your body is cleansed and fed and oxygenated by blood and if you don't get enough blood circulation to extremities you can have problems blood the life is in the blood what a, a scientifically perfect statement I remember very troubling experience when I was a young man going to school in Maine actually not very far from where they had that shooting last week and I was it was winter the I roads were completely covered with snow and we were driving uh, down the road with our school van. I was in the front seat with the driver. And we were following a dump truck that was going very slow. And then we saw that from one of the houses he drove by, this dog, a beautiful husky-like dog, ran out. You've seen dogs kind of come out when cars go down country roads and they bark at the cars and try to nip at the tires. This dog came running out to nip at the tires because the dump truck was so loud and it didn't realize the ice was so slick on the road, and the dog, instead of stopping, it slid underneath the truck. Tumbled out from under the truck in front of us. I saw it all happen. He said, oh, no. 
And the driver slowed down. He looked in his rearview mirror, and he kept going. And we stopped, and this dog was still alive, but mortally wounded. And we got out and ran over, and the thing was looking up at us, kind of whimpering. And um, we tried to comfort it, and its blood was running out on the white snow. And the steam was coming off, and there's nothing we could do. And we just saw the life run out of this beautiful dog. And I, you know, I just never could forget that image of the brilliant scarlet blood on that white snow and the life running out of that, per, that uh, creature. And so when it says the life is in the blood, and the, you know, then on when I read in the Bible about the blood of Jesus, it, it helps me understand it's the life of Jesus that he gave. He laid down his life. When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he said, not my will, thy will be done. And we, he accepted taking the sins of all the world. It felt to Jesus, sin was so awful, that he would be forever separated from the Father. He felt like a hopeless sinner would feel facing the judgment. So he took that from us. And we, I think when we appreciate how much love that would be. You know, Moses had that kind of love. He said, Father, strike my name from the book of life but save your people. And Paul said, I would that I could be lost if Israel could be saved. To have that kind of self-sacrificing love where you would sacrifice eternity that someone else might be saved. Jesus was facing the second death in order to save you. That's how much he loves you. What sin would be worth more to you than him? And then eternal life. It's a powerful thought when you really embrace that. Number six, what does the labor represent? Talked about the altar. It says, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. We need to be baptized in the Spirit. The altar, we need to be baptized in the labor, the water. You can even read in 1 Corinthians, oh, here's this one's from Romans chapter 6, verse 3. It says, Or do you not know that as many of you as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in what? A newness of life. After baptism, you're born again, you walk in a newness of life, all the old sins are gone. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 is where Paul says in verse 1 and 2, Moreover, brethren, I don't want you to be unaware of our fathers who were under the cloud, pillar of fire, and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Jesus said, we must be born of the water and the Spirit. little amazing fact I think you'll find interesting. The world was all washed with water in the days of Noah. The Bible says when Christ comes, the world's going to be washed in fire, 2 Peter chapter 3. And then God's going to make a new heaven and new earth. Before the world is born again, it goes through a water and a fire baptism also. So everybody and everything must go through those baptisms. And that's what baptism is a symbol of. A washing, you hold your breath momentarily. It's a new birth, new beginning. Number seven, what were the other items that were in the holy place? We're making our way through the sanctuary. You can read here. And on the, say it, the table of showbread, they shall spread a blue cloth and put it on the dishes and the pans and the bowls and the pitchers, pouring, and the showbread shall be on it. They had a table with bread. And so that was always, when you went into the sanctuary, that would be on the left side. You go straight towards the altar would be, the Ark of the Covenant, rather, would be in front of you in the altar of incense. On the right, then you would, I'm sorry, on the right you'd have the, the bread. On the left you would have the candlestick. That leads us to the next thing. In Numbers 8, verse 2, it says, when you arrange the, the lamp, the seven lamps shall give light in front of the lampstand. So, so far we've got two articles of furniture. You've got the bread and you've got the light. What's next? And you shall make an altar to burn incense on. They had an altar of incense. Now, we're going to talk about what do these things represent. They're very important. So... It just so happens that we happen to have some copies of these things here in the church tonight, and so we're going to demonstrate that to you. Here, in front of me, I've got the, let me see, going there, yeah, yeah. We got the, the bread. How many loaves of bread were there? Twelve. 
one for each one of the tribes of Israel. Who is the bread? Who is the bread that came down from heaven? Jesus is the bread. And this is saying that the people of God were to be fed with the bread of life. Then you come over here and then you've got the light. Who is the light? Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But not only did Jesus say, I am the light of the world, he said, what? You are the light of the world. Now, we don't have light of our own, but we reflect his light. And how many lights were there? Seven. And what kept the light burning? It was pure virgin oil. And that was because it was a symbol for the Holy Spirit. It was a special oil they used in the sanctuary, but it was olive oil. And it's a symbol for the Spirit that keeps the light burning. We need that Spirit to keep the light burning. You are like the light of the world. You are not to put your light under a bush, but to be set upon a hill. But we are reflecting the light of Jesus. We have no light in ourselves. He is the bread, but you know what else Jesus did with the bread? Jesus not only said, I'm the bread of life, He said to the disciples, you give them something to eat. Jesus broke the bread, gave it to the disciples, they gave it to the people, it multiplied in their hands. So all of these things that God does for us, He also wants us to do for Him as His representatives. Jesus said, as the Father sent me, so send I you. So you've got the, the bread, and you've got the light, and then the third thing is what? It's the altar of incense. Now, it was on the horns of the altar that the priest would come in, and he would spread blood for the daily sacrifices. It wasn't until the Day of Atonement that they went into the Holy of Holies. What does this altar represent? It's a symbol for the prayers of God's people. They would put incense on it, and the incense, often fragrance, uh, frankincense, and they might have myrrh or some other essence, it would waft over the curtain into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies, and it represented the prayers of the people. In these three articles of the altar of incense, you've got prayer, you've got the light, and you've got the bread. This represents the three disciplines in the Christian life. If I could tell you a secret weapon to get to heaven, would you be interested? If I could tell you there's a button you could push, you push this button, you'll be saved. Amen. Well, here it is, friends. If you want to get to the Holy of Holies, you need to make it through the holy place. In the holy place, you've got bread. You need to read your Bible. You've got the light. You've got to witness and let your light shine. And keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the light of the world. Let that light be burning in you. You need the Holy Spirit, that oil. And you need to be praying. That's that altar of incense. These are the three primary disciplines of the Christian life. And um, practice those things and you'll make it. By the way, in the wilderness, all of that was there. They had in the wilderness, they had the, the light. Did God have light that He illuminated them? Did He give them bread from heaven? Did He answer their prayers? And so what you see in these articles that were in the first apartment of the sanctuary was also the experience of the children of Israel, and it's supposed to be your experience as well. All right, we're going to keep going. Where did Jesus go after his resurrection? Answer, Christ has not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself now to appear in the presence of God for us. Where is Jesus now? Now, you know, Christ may appear to you in a dream. He might speak to you through the Holy Spirit. Jesus did speak to Paul even after his ascension. Jesus is not handcuffed to one spot in heaven. He is God. He's free to go where he wants. But his principal place of work and ministry is as our high priest in heaven at the right hand of power, the ruler of the universe. He is enthroned. And you just read some of the beautiful statements Paul makes regarding Christ in the beginning and end of his letters, makes it clear about his position and his deity to, with God. Again, Hebrews 9, verse 11. Christ came as high priest of the good things to come with a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation. All right. Is it clear to you that there is a tabernacle in heaven? Is it clear to you from what we're reading in the New Testament, Jesus is our high priest. He is our mediator. In the same way Moses would go from the people to God and from God to the people, Christ is the ladder between heaven and earth. Even on the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus was glorified. And God said, this is my son. And Moses and Elijah said, he is the one. 
And then you had Peter, James, and John. So you had three humans, Peter, James, and John. And you had three divine God, Elijah, Moses. Then you had Jesus, who is the bridge between the earthly and the divine. Christ said to uh, Nathaniel, you're impressed because I said I saw you under the fig tree. You'll see greater things than these. Hereafter, you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus is the escalator through which the angels come to and from heaven and earth. He is the bridge. He is our high priest. The Bible says He ever lives to make intercession for us. He is interceding. He is pleading not the blood of a goat or a lamb. Whose blood is He pleading? He's pleading His own blood before the people as our high priest. Now, there's some interesting verses about the temple that play in with what we're studying today. Mark chapter 14, verse 58. The people said at his trial, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days I will build another one made without hands. Where is the temple of God today? In the Old Testament, there were two temples. One on earth, sometimes it was destroyed, they'd rebuild it, and one in heaven. The one on earth was activated until the one in heaven had blood to activate it. When Jesus rose from the dead, Mary Magdalene saw him there at the tomb. She went to grab him and worship him. He said, Mary, do not detain me. I have not yet ascended to my Father. Go tell the brethren that I ascend to my God and your God. He ascended to heaven. His sacrifice was declared successful. The heavenly sacrifice, the heavenly sanctuary was activated because now Christ is not pleading the blood of lambs. He's pleading His blood. See what's happening? The earthly sanctuary, Jesus said, your house is left to you desolate. He walked out. The veil was rent when He died on the cross. The purpose for the earthly sanctuary is null and void. Now, why is that important today with the headlines? Christians around the world and even some Jews are hoping the day will come when they can build another temple on Mount Moriah. They read a verse in the Bible, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, where Paul talking about the beast power said, that wicked one who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or worship sits in the temple of God showing himself he is God. And they think, well, in order for the beast to sit in the temple of God, the temple of God has to be rebuilt. Unless Paul is not talking about a physical temple. And that's what I'm telling you, friends. Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, I'll make another without hands. What was he talking about? He spoke of his body. What is the church called? The body of Christ. Did you know Paul said, not only is your body individually a temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul speaking to the church said, well, don't you know, ye are the temple of God. This is why Peter said, you are a living priesthood. We are living stones. Ephesians chapter 2, and the other one was 1 Peter chapter 2, this one is Ephesians chapter 2. He said, we're of the household of God. We are built together on Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone, He is the foundation, and we grow into a holy habitation. We are the temple of God on earth now. The beast power trying to sit in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God, is being fulfilled right now in a spiritual sense. Don't miss the studies that are coming. We're going to talk about that. The world is waiting for a physical temple to be built. They're missing the point entirely. Jesus is pretty clear. Do, do we need to sacrifice lambs anymore? And by the way, my Jewish friends, they're not looking forward to a temple where they sacrifice lambs. They've adjusted the theology in the last 1900 years where they don't need to sacrifice lambs anymore. I don't have any Jewish friends that are saying, I hope they'll hurry up and build the temple so we can start buying and killing lambs. You don't see that emphasis if you go to Israel. Oh, there may be some extremists that are talking about that, but the rank and file people. You know what's going to happen? If, if the Jews were to go to Mount Zion and bulldoze the Dome of the Rock, the Mosque of Omar up there, you'd have World War III right now. That's not what's going to happen. The devil's got everybody diverted looking for something else when it's happening right under their noses. That wicked one is already sitting in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. And I'll prove it to you if you keep coming. I hope you don't miss what's ahead because it's very important. That's why this study is so crucial. Jesus is our high priest. One more thing. Uh, I took this picture of the high priest. We actually, this is in the magazine that we're offering everybody tonight, a divine design. We uh, had our own priestly garments we made for the photographs. 
on the breastplate of the high priest, you had 12 stones, all different, representing God's church the, that were on the heart of the priest. He was praying and interceding for the tribes, for the people of God. The 12 stones are also the same 12 stones that are foundation stones in the New Jerusalem. And so, and you'll notice in the gates of the New Jerusalem, it's got the names of the 12 apostles. The foundations have got the names of the 12 tribes. It's all talking about God's people that will be in that city. But the priest had them on his heart. And Jesus has you on his heart. And the other thing I like about that, they're all different. Isn't God's church made up of different people with different gifts and different characters? But they're all converted and they love the Lord. <laughs> but you look at the apostles, they were all different. Number nine, it tells us how do these three items in the holy place relate to the plan of salvation. I sort of explained that already, but let's review it again, uh, review it again quickly. It says, for instance, in John chapter four, uh, 1, verse 14, the Word, the what? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus is that Word. He is also the bread of life. He answered and said, it is written, this is Matthew 4, 4, Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. He answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread, but every word. He is that true light that gives light to everyone that comes into the world. Not only is Jesus the bread, He is the light, He is our high priest. It says that He intercedes for us. And you read this in Hebrews 7.25. Therefore He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come unto God by him since he always lives to make intercession for us. So those articles there in the holy place talks about the Bible that illuminates the study of our word. You've got the power of our witness and the aid of our prayers. You've got the bread of life, the light, and our prayers. And these are things that we practice in a very real way in the Christian life. Friends, read your Bible. Don't be afraid to share your faith. Be bold, amen, for the Lord and spend time talking to God. Now, in conclusion, what special article was situated in the most holy place? We've saved the best for last. What was it? The Ark of the Covenant. You shall put the mercy seat upon the Ark of the Testimony in the most holy place. And as you may have hoped, I think we've even got an Ark here tonight that I can point to. This Ark of the Covenant was a box the important thing was not the golden box, the angels on top. They called that the mercy seat, the Shekinah glory where the Lord would meet with His people. The important thing was what was in the box. It was the holy, it was the holy Ark of the Covenant. Now think about this. How many of you know what the Holy Land is? Where is it? Israel. You with me? And in the Holy Land, they've got the holy city. Which city? Say it a little louder. Okay. In the holy city, there's a holy mountain. What's the holy mountain? Mount Zion, sometimes called Mount Moriah, correct. And on that mountain, they had the holy temple. You with me so far? And in the holy temple, they had the holy place. And beyond the holy place, they had the holy of holies. And what was in the holy of holies? One thing. The Ark of the Covenant. Was the Ark holy or what's in the whole Ark of the Covenant? The Ten Commandments. And you know the word holy appears one time in the Ten Commandments. It's in the Fourth Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Because we serve God with our time. The Word of God was the most sacred treasure of the Hebrew people and it was in the Ark of the Covenant. And uh, they had poles so that they could carry it uh, some pictures will show that they had, you know, one priest on each corner. I think there were actually, there was a priest representing each tribe. They had three priests on each pole because it was a golden box with rocks inside. It was very heavy and it would get tiring to carry it for long. So 12 priests used to carry the Ark of the Covenant. It was the national treasure and it is the epicenter of what is considered holy in the world today. I'd love to see them discover and find that. Wouldn't that be something? Number 11. What does the Ark of the Covenant signify? Hebrews 4.16 Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. 
Why does it say come boldly? Remember where did someone go when they needed mercy? They'd go to the altar on the outside. But now because of Jesus, we can enter right into the presence of God where only the high priest used to go. Christ is our friend, our mediator, where he intercedes for us there in the Holy of Holies. And he is pleading not the blood of a lamb as the ancient Hebrew priests, but he's pleading his own blood. And question number 12. Are you willing to follow Christ's plan of salvation as symbolized by the path through the sanctuary? You got it, friends? You enter the sanctuary, how many doors was there? There was one door, and you came through the door, there was an altar of sacrifice. We accept the sacrifice of Jesus. Then they came to a laver. We are baptized. After baptism, we enter a new dimension. You go into the holy place where we feed on the bread of life. We are illuminated by the light of the Spirit. We intercede for ourselves and others with the prayers of the saints. And someday soon, Jesus is going to come and we're going to go through that veil and we will be in glory in the presence of God. But you can go through the veil right now by faith when you're on your knees. You are entering into the Holy of Holies and speaking to God through Jesus, your high priest. Isn't that something to think about, friends? Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things that we are saying. Here's the main point, friends. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens. Jesus Christ. Have you ever noticed in life sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know? Have you ever found it beneficial to have a friend in high places that got you out of a fix or had connections? You're not going to find any friend in higher places. You're not going to find any friend that is better connected with Jesus, your high priest, that is at the right hand of God Almighty of the infinite cosmos. And He is there pleading your name. When you pray, Say, Lord, forgive me. Jesus holds out his nail-pierced hands and pleads his own blood for you. And he says he will forgive you and give you power and lead you and transform you. How many of you want that experience? The way of God is in the sanctuary. Let me pray with you. Loving Lord, we've had a lot to think about tonight. And I pray the principles of truth that will do the most to transform us will sink in and find a home in our hearts. Help us be different the way you want us to be different. Cleanse us, wash us, fill us with your spirit, Lord, and prepare us that we might prepare others for the last days. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, friends. When's our next study? Tomorrow night. You don't want to miss this. We're talking about the hour of judgment. It's part two, the best part of tonight. Come and bring your friends. God bless you, and thank you very much.